next talk, do you have any kids? Yes. Raise your hands if you have kids. Raise your hand. Keep them up. Keep them up. Yes. I don't have kids, but I'm just yes. explaining. <laughs> no, 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 no. Are you no. related to any kids? Raise your hands if you're related to any kids. Uh, raise your hand if you know a kid. Test. Okay. Um, Keep them up there. This? I've seen people we drop their hands. Um, uh, what was the last one? Do you think you might know a kid in the future? Uh, so can see it. Eh. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. You can put them down. Uh, JavaScript is really great. This yeah. next talk is a father and son duo. It's okay. Jason and Michael Strawn. And they're going to be talking about teaching kids to code. Let's give them a round of applause. Gracias. Thank you. Uh, so our talk is Teaching Kids to Code by a 13-year-old. And if you can take one look at me, you can probably guess I'm not 13. <laughs> so what I'd like to do is start off by introducing my son, Michael, who is 13. Hi, my name is Michael Strawn. I am a 13-year-old who enjoys all things Pokemon, Lego, Star Wars, Marvel, um, video games, and I will play all day if you let me. No joke. He will. My name is Jason Strawn. I own a couple of technology companies and am the CEO of CodeUp. Uh, I also like Star Wars and Legos a lot. I'm learning about Pokemon, and I think video games are okay. That's right, Jason. Awesome. So, like I said, our talk's about teaching kids to code. And I think one of the best ways to start is to even ask the question, why should kids code? Now, most of us in the room are adults, and I think we have a, a strong opinion about that, right? We think that the future has a lot of technology, that the workforce is going to need the youth of today as they grow up to have a better understanding of software. But I thought it was really interesting to ask Michael why kids should learn to code, and this is the list he came up with. Well, the first, region, uh, bleh, the first reason is that kids need a better understanding of technology. Right now, most of the kids I know think technology is Netflix, YouTube, video games, uh, a screen. That's pretty much all they think it is. And they need a better understanding of how technology works. And also, coding sparks imagination. Uh, coding uh, it helps the part of the brain that makes create, uh, creative things happen, also known as all the brain. And it is very imaginative and can help a lot. It's a great way to teach children logic. It's a great way to let them do problem solving. When they code, they may find a bug. They will use the problem solving ter um, lessons that they've learned during the time, and they will see it happen. And they can learn how things work. They can learn how, um, I don't know a good uh, thing. You're fine. They learn how things work by seeing how it works on the, behind the scenes, correct? Yeah, correct. Awesome. It's also cool to program things. It's cool to build Legos. It's cool to uh, play games. It is very cool to program things on a computer using your own mind. And it's fun. It's fun to see the results. It's fun to see what your imagination can bring. Awesome. Thank you. Now, I think that when we go about trying to teach kids to code, it's very easy to do it the wrong way, right? We introduce the wrong concepts at the wrong times. And I like to think of if you were to teach a child how to play a musical instrument, first you would have them you know, play a song, then you might see if they're gonna learn sheet music, and after that you might teach music theory. But we wanted to talk a little bit about the wrong way to teach code, and Michael had a little bit of an experience with this over last summer. Well, over last summer, I went to a Java coding camp for Minecraft mods, and I learned on hand how terrible Java is when you're a kid. <laughs> it was fun, but I did not like it. Uh, it was very hard, and I didn't know how anything worked, and it, I was even a 13-year-old, and I thought it was bleh. Making them learn to type is another bad way to uh, start coding. Kids, when they're like eight or eight, uh, seven or eight, they want to use their pointer fingers. They want to do one key at a time. They don't want to use all fingers, okay? And using complicated tools like Eclipse is also another terrible way to start. Um, when I was doing Java coding, we used Eclipse. I had no clue what was happening up in there. <laughs> <laughs> it was mayhem. D never. Never do that to kids. It'll be torture. 
uh, and forcing them to learn the vocabulary, like, uh, c c what was it, Dad? Ca con concatenation. Ca ca Never Concatenation. Mind. There we are. Making them learn vocabulary like that is not fun, as I just tried to do. Um, I think that they really need to learn math, uh, math first, like algebra, calculus, pre-algebra. They don't need that. Well, they, oh, I'm sorry. They don't need to know math to start coding, and you may continue now. There we go. Thank you. Um, and so these are, I think, the wrong way to start programming. I think we can all agree that these are things you need to know if you're going to be a great software developer. But to introduce programming, that these are really, we think, the wrong way to start. What I have found as a parent is that after he got into programming and had written some video games, these are the things that he comes back to me now and wants to know. He wants to learn uh, you know, better languages than what we're going to show you. Not He's really yet, interested in uh, the tooling Maybe not so much the vocabulary, but math is also now his favorite subject. And I think that most of that came from his introduction to programming a little earlier on. So what we'd like to do, I know this is a JavaScript conference, but we, as we said, typing's a little hard for kids. So we want to introduce you to another programming language called Scratch that was developed by MIT. It's super cool. <laughs> Next slide. Um, so, Michael, can you tell us a little bit about what is Scratch? Well, Scratch is a visual programming language. As I said before, they do not like to type. So, Scratch is a drag-and-drop interface. You drag little blocks of code and snap them together like Lego bricks. And it was developed by MIT in 2003. A 2.0 came out in 2013. And 3.0 is in development right now, almost out. It's amazing. It's for ages 8 and up. When did I start? 7 or 8? Somewhere around there. And it was perfect for my age. Right now, there's over 22 million users, and it's perfect because they have a community that makes and shares projects and remixes them and make them either better or worse. Either works. And there's roughly about 25,000 new members per day. That's a lot of people. Uh, you're supposed to... Oh, is I supposed to do something? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like getting off script a little bit, right? <laughs> awesome. So why don't you tell us how many languages it's available in? <laughs> so Scratch is available in over 70 languages. It does require internet access and Flash. 3.0 won't use Flash, though, so yes. We're excited. 3.0 has no Flash. Awesome. So if you're going to teach kids to code and you're going to use Scratch, the first thing you have to do is get it. And I'm here to tell you it's incredibly simple. You just point your browser to scratch.mit.edu and click Create. Uh, you may have to enable Flash. Like we said, version 2 still uses uh. it. But apart from that, it's a two-step process. Scratch.mit.edu, click Create, and you'll get a screen that looks just like this where you can start writing code immediately. Um, so, I think the best way to get going is to go ahead and have a quick start, and then we're going to spend the rest of the time doing some live coding. I hope that that works for everybody. So, here is the classic stage you'll get at a new project. In the top left corner, you can see there's the stage. That's where all the code output is going to happen. That's where sprites are going to move and backdrops are going to change. Um, backdrops are the stages of the sta uh, stage. That's play on words, isn't it? That's fine. It was states of the stage. Stage of the stage. It doesn't matter. Um, it just changes the stage look and feel. Um, right next to that is sprites. Those are the images that will be moving using a move 10 steps block or change color using a change color effect by 25 things block. And that's, th that's where all the moving is probably going to happen. Right next to that is the blocks. Those are the chunks of code that will be piecing together like Legos to make a game, a cartoon, something such as that. Um, at the top of the blocks area, you can see there's the uh, tabs. And those are the different categories of code that you can use, such as motion, looks, and sounds. I don't want to go too deep into it right now. But um, next to that is the coding area. That's where you're going to be placing your code together clicking the start button, and getting it all running. Awesome. So next we're going to do just a quick start to get Scratch Cat talking. Scratch Cat, tell us a little bit. Who is Scratch Cat? Scratch Cat is the Mickey Mouse of Scratch. He's the default image that you get on every load. And so we're going to make Scratch speak. So first go to the event tab and drag the when flag is clicked block onto the coding area. That is pretty much the start button block. 
Then go to the looks tab and grab the say hello block and connect it with the previous block. Type in what you want Scratch Cat to say. For instance, in this picture, we have hello world. And then press the star icon, which is the green flag at the top, and watch him speak. Awesome. Why don't we go ahead and do this so we can see it in action. So right here is a new page of Scratch, barely touch, and we're going to start coding on it. So first, go to the events tab and grab the wind flag is clicked and drag it onto the coding area. Then go to looks and, type, and get the say hello for two seconds. Then change it with what you want it to say. For instance, I want to put... I still use my pointer fingers. <laughs> we haven't got to the typing stage yet. So he's maximized it, hits the plus. Hola, JS Conf. Woohoo! It worked, finally! <laughs> All right. So now that we've seen a little bit about programming Scratch, what would you do about creating your own artwork in Scratch? So first you need to go to the Costumes tab and, and use, you can either use the artwork supplied by Scratch, create your own art, I prefer pixel art, it's my favorite, um, or upload your art from the web using the download art feature. And guess what we're going to do now, Jason? What's that? We're going to actually build stuff. By the way, it's still dad. Uh. And no way. No, really, we're going to uh, do stuff right now, so get ready. Awesome, let's see it. So while Michael's getting set up here, what you're going to see is another tab where he's already built some of that pixel art. Again, if you click on the costumes tab, you can not only use rendered uh, art that's supplied, but you can create your own. In this case, he created Kool-Aid Man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so what he's going to do is uh, start with a game where Kool-Aid Man is going to have thirsty children coming after him for a drink, and Kool-Aid Man's going to quench their thirst. But first, we need to start by getting Kool-Aid Man to move around the screen. You can also see he created the stage to be green. So why don't you kick us off with being able to use uh, your arrow keys to move Kool-Aid Man? Okay, so the first thing we're going to need is the wind flag is click block. You always need this when you're making a game in Scratch, or anything in Scratch, for that matter. Then you go to the control and grab a forever and an if block, and attach them to the wind flag is click, and attach that to forever. So it should be forever asking the question, if something happened, then do whatever is inside the block. That's something that we're going to be doing is, not touching mouse pointer, uh, key space press, but not space. We're going to make it right arrow. So whenever right arrow is pressed, it will do something. We're going to go to motion and do point and direction 90 because in this, it's like... Uh, uh, 360 degree circle, 100, 90 is right. Yeah, so 90 is right, then move 10 steps. So now, let me go to full mode, click the flag, and... All right, we hit the button, Kool-Aid Man moves. Wow, we get a lot of applause at this. I like this room. Well, we have a hilarious show. Yeah, this is good great. Content. Uh, all right, so can we make him go more than one direction? Oh, yeah, we can. Let's see it. So you can right-click this and duplicate it, a plus of scratch. You don't have to do so much coding. Yeah. And then you do, instead of right arrow, do left arrow. All and right. point in direction left. All right, let's see him move. Is that so, connected? Yeah. Yes, it is. So now if I click the flag, yoink. Oh, now he does the moonwalk. But he, but Kool Aid Man's that slick. <laughs> he's that fly. Well, can we make him look that direction whenever he's moving that way instead of always walking backwards? Do we have to? I think it'd be fun. Fine. So if we go back to the costumes, we'll be able to see that there's actually two different versions of Kool Aid Man. Where you can do Man. moonwalk any way you want. There we go. All right, so let's make him change the way that he's facing whenever he moves. So go to the looks tab and grab which costume, and it'll default to the one that has the uh, less characters, I think. It's something like that. And then you just switch it to Kool-Aid Man right and Kool-Aid Man left. Full. Man, sorry, Kool-Aid Man. You can't do the moonwalk no more. And now Kool-Aid Man looks both ways when he walks. Can we make him go up and down? Okay. So you just right-click this and duplicate them both. And since there's no up and down costume, we don't need the up and down, so just throw those away. They're, they're garbage. You are so garbage. So now you just get um, up and down arrows on these. So I have up and down. Change this to up. Change this to down. And full screen. All right, let's make you move around. Voila! So now he goes every which way you go. Go up and down. 
diagonal. And see, when we talk about kids want to see immediate results with programming, we've seen in what, less than five minutes or around five minutes, we have a sprite moving all over the screen using the keypads. But that's only the beginning of a game. This is only going to keep them around for so long. So we told you that Kool-Aid Man was going to be chased by thirsty children that wanted to quench their thirst. So why don't we go ahead and get an, introduce another sprite, the house, and show how we can write code to create a non-player character. So first, I'm just going to right-click the house and show it, because it's hidden right now. It's very shy. It's okay. These are nice people. Um, they won't bite, I hope. Um, so you go to the costume tab, and as you can see, there's two costumes. Let me just get this over. So there's two costumes, a house and a kid. So I'm guessing the kid comes out the house, right? Sounds like a plan. So you go to scripts and go to events and get the wind flag is click block. Of course. And if you notice, he's doing all this coding inside the sprite that is the house or the kid. Each sprite gets its own set of code, and they kind of act like objects. So now we have a forever block and a uh, wind flag is clicked block. Though we're not going to be asking the question if something happened, we're going to say, create a clone of myself. And then, but first, we don't want clones coming out like, Pew! We want them to wait a few seconds because they may get thirsty after a while. So you get wait one second. But one second's too short, isn't it? I think so. Why don't we do a random number? Okay, so you go to operation, get the pick random, one to ten seconds. So of that, we're going to do two to six seconds. Awesome. So every two to six seconds, a duplicate or a clone of the house will show up and do nothing because we don't have any code for the clone. Well, let's create some code for that. Deal. Um, Get the when I start as a clone block, which is whenever the clone is made, it will do whatever this block has under it. The thing under that is going to be repeat until something happens. That something happens, will be, we'll do in a second. We're going to go to motion, do uh, point towards, not mouse pointer, but point towards Kool-Aid Man. Move 10 steps, which is 10 steps too fast. Let's go with a solid 3.5 and see what happens if we go into full screen. I'll just wait for that. So every two to six seconds, we get a clone of the house that chases Kool-Aid Man. <laughs> um, I don't know that we need houses chasing Kool-Aid Man. They're typically not that thirsty. How would we turn that house into the, the kid that you drew? Um, really? I want houses to chase Kool-Aid well, Man. Well, we can leave it at that, then, but I think we still have about 15 minutes. Fine. So switch costume to kid. So whenever, it's a clone, whenever the clone spawns, wait for it. Wait for it. There we go. So now we've got a kid chasing Kool-Aid Man trying to quench his thirst. We should get a second one that comes out. There we go. All right. But the oh, problem... no. <laughs> the problem is when they catch Kool-Aid Man, they don't disappear. They should probably go away. Can well, we show everybody thirsty. how that would happen? So what, what are we doing now? Let's make the kids disappear when they catch Kool-Aid Man. Okay. So it says, when I start as a clone, repeat until. That repeat until is going to be touching... The mouse pointer, of course. No. A touching Kool-Aid Man. So pee into a touching Kool-Aid Man, go to control, and get delete this clone. So when it touches Kool-Aid Man, it's going to poof out of existence. Wow, you must have been that thirsty. We might not have made it two to six seconds. We have to wait too long on the kids to spawn. There they come. And boom. Nope. Ah, there we go. <laughs> and now when the kids touch Kool-Aid Man, Man, they disappear. Well, I think it'd be better, instead of drinking out of the big pitcher that is Kool-Aid Man, if he could throw glasses of Kool-Aid at them and quench their thirst even faster. How would we go about doing that? So first, uh, one house is too easy, actually. Don't oh, you want to do two houses? Yeah. All right, let's make it uh, twice as hard. Scratch, right-click this, duplicate it, and now we have house one and house two. All yeah, right. Hi! So let's put house two out there and see what happens. Oh, I have to move it back to the original position. Yoinks. Zoom. Start. And now we have twice as many kids coming out and chasing Kool-Aid Man. I think it's definitely time that we have a place where we can quench their thirst. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, now we're just going to go to the glass, which is what Kool-Aid Man's going to be throwing at these thirsty kill uh, children. Wow. <laughs> Well, good. and they're drinking Kool-Aid Man. He's going to die eventually. Well, come on. Let's show him how he can get him a glass of tasty beverage. Fine. So go to the events tab and grab the wind flag. <laughs> I didn't even mean that joke. Um, go to the uh, control. Get a forever and an if. Forever ask the question. If he spaces press, and actually it's going to stay spaced this time uh, first. Um, so forever, if he spaces press, control, create a clone of myself. 
and wait until. So if I have it, if I have it just like this, if I press space, it's going to be machine gun or neon cat or whatever you want it to be. We want to make it where you have to actually hit the space button to do something. So we're going to have to wait until operators not and then just duplicate, key space down. But, oh, no, dang it. Or you can delete it and start over. That'll work. Yeah, I think that'll work. There we go. Okay. The space. So now, whenever key space is pressed... Nothing uh, happens. Well, nothing happens. Right, because now you're creating a clone. That so what do we have to do? We have to give the clone something to do. Oh, okay. That must be a very bored clone if it doesn't have anything to do. Anyway, um, so when I start as a clone... First, you go to looks and get show. Right now, the glass is, glass is hidden because it would make no sense if there's just glass laying around doing nothing. Um, so when it starts to clone show, the motion, go to, uh, go to Kool-Aid Man. Well, if you ever drag, there you go. Go to Kool-Aid, no, house two. Kool-Aid Man. Go to Kool-Aid Man. Got it. And uh, control. Where is it? Oh, repeat until. Uh, touching. Sorry, I get nervous when I'm on stage. Edge. So when I start, uh, when I start to clone, show, go to Kool-Aid Man, repeat until touching edge, and there's nothing inside there. woo -hoo! So um, go to motion and do move 10 steps, but I think 10 steps is a bit too slow. So move 15 steps. So now... He's farting Kool-Aid. <laughs> All right. So now let's try to make it where you can throw the Kool-Aid glasses each direction. Actually, they're, they're, uh, when they hit the edge, they're staying there. Can we make that close when they Just hit the edge? Just that close. Awesome. So yeah. now let's make it to where whatever direction Kool-Aid man's pointing, that's the direction that the glass would throw uh, left or right. We don't need to go up or down. Yeah, that makes no sense, up or down. Um, so go to data. This is where you make variables, I guess. I bet all you know what variables are. Um, if you don't then I don't know if you know JS. Yeah, wrong conference. Yeah, wrong conference. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to make a variable. How are we sitting on time, by the way? Um, I guess we don't have a time on here, so let's keep on going. All right. So Give this, it a variable name. This variable name is going to be directiones. Uh, direction, okay. Uh, don't try that. I think you're getting it all right. That's it, it not better. spelled right, but that'll work. Okay. <laughs> so all we have... Whatever makes you happy. Yeah, whatever makes us happy. Directiones makes me happy. Okay. So when flag is clicked, we're going to go right arrow, said directions to, or directiones, I'd say it correctly, directiones to uh, 90, <laughs> and go down to uh, get another one, said directiones to... <laughs> I don't even know if that's the right word. We're just going to hope and pray. <laughs> let's just hope and pray. All right, so let's see it in action. Loose. So, well, it, it, well, oh, you're right. Sorry. The cup isn't ready yet. So we've set the variable. And the variable's in Scratch or Global. So when you set one in uh, one sprite, it's accessible from others. Unless you choose. So you can do it both ways. But we created this one globally. So go to Motion and point in Direction. Are you ready for this? Direction on is. All right. So now let's click Play. So now. And whichever way he's pointing, he throws glasses of Kool-Aid at thirsty children. No, they aren't drinking that. Miss. But they're not drinking it. I think that's the one last thing we'll probably be able to get in. So if you can make it to where when the kids get the glass of Kool-Aid, they're happy and they quit chasing Kool-Aid Man. Okay. Woohoo! So uh, repeat until touching Kool-Aid Man. That's not the only thing we want to stop at. Repeat until touching Kool-Aid Man or touching Kool-Aid Man. Uh, I don't think that's going to work. Uh, touching Kool-Aid Man or touching glass. That'll probably work. I'm just going to drag this to the other house. Because that's another thing you can do in Scratch. Woohoo! Okay, that sounded more weird than I expected. But All right. So now let's see it. Wait, wait, eh. Eh. There we go. So now if we start. All right, so we can run around. Thirsty children are coming out. Kool-Aid bands quenching their thirst. And hey, we got a video game. All right, so if you want to start loading up the final version, Michael. Yeah, I'll show you guys the final okay. version. Okay, so again, I think the point here was in a very short amount of time, with very little overhead, we were able to create a game quickly, and we hope that all of you can go find somebody that's a kid that you can help teach to code. In another talk earlier this year, in about 45 minutes, Michael was able to program this completely on stage. We wanted to show you the full version since we had a compressed time limit today. So this is called Kool-Aid Crush. Oh, yeah.
So you press K to begin. Wait, what? Hold on. Third. I press K to begin, and we have a new thing. So Not here we see in the final game that he has a limited number of cups of Kool-Aid that he can throw. We can also see that he can refill Kool-Aid packets. If we life. let one of the children grab him, boom, it takes some of the Kool-Aid out of the pitcher that is Kool-Aid Man until eventually he has none left. He can pick up packets for health, and we're going to go ahead and let him get drank out of and in the game <laughs> so that we can see the end, me? and oh, no. Can you take us back over to our slide deck, please? Thank you very much for having us out. We really appreciate it. My name. Thank you. My name's Jason Strawn. You can contact me at jason at codeup.com or JD Strawn. I am Michael Strawn, also known as Master Builder Michael. You can see why. Um, I'm at masterbuildermichael at gmail.com, and thank you for coming to our talk. My gosh. Michael, turn around. Yeah. <laughs>